Hey, everybody, we are live. I am Seth Payne, former Houston Texans player, current sports radio host on Sports Radio 610. Uh, D'Amico spoke at the Combine today, and this is going to be a fun beginning of the week for D'Amico because the defensive line and linebackers work out first on Thursday. The first crack at all the meetings will be with those guys, and we know that D'Amico has already said that they want to spend resources on that defensive line. The linebacker position is very, very important in, in his defense. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say today and also um, just stop fighting with my colleagues for just one blessed moment about whether or not the Texans should sign Saquon Barkley. We'll get to that later. D'Amico, uh, up first, he was asked about what he saw with CJ early on in terms of skill set and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, he said hello to everybody. Yeah, with CJ, the uh, the things that stood out from the skill standpoint is, as we all saw him, right, he can put the ball anywhere he needs to uh, in a very accurate manner. Uh, he did a very good job of just his demeanor. I think at that quarterback position, when you have a very calm demeanor and your teammates see that, right, it, it's a confidence, right? It's a calm confidence that kind of exudes throughout the entire locker room, and that's what CJ has, and I think those are the skills that allowed him to be very successful as a rookie and have one of the best uh, rookie seasons for a quarterback in our league's history. So very excited about what TJ did this year, but I'm also even more excited about the things that he can improve on and where he can get better, continuing to lead our team this next year. Definitely looking for a huge jump in his growth from year one to year two. Okay, a jump in his growth from year one to year two. I think that's something that we've heard CJ himself say, which is very cool to hear because CJ will be the first to remind everybody, look, I'm, I'm still a rookie. I've still got a lot to learn. I think pass protection and his ability to identify and then set protections is going to be a huge, huge, huge step forward for him. Um, as far as his, D'Amico's demeanor, I'm, I'm glad that D'Amico is talking about that because I think that a lot of times people make the obvious comparison between D'Amico and Will Anderson in terms of their mindset, both being defensive players, both being from Alabama. But that calm demeanor, that's a that's a CJ and D'Amico shared trait. Will is not calm, like not in a bad way. He's not calm in a very, very good way, but he's certainly not calm. And D'Amico can get hype, but like I think his ability to kind of take the highs and lows and just cruise on through uh, with a an even keel is very much a, a shared trait between him and cj next question was a, a general question about what the hell did i write down here oh oh okay just about like maybe the types of players or what guys are, are he is he looking for at the combine well for me every season you start over okay they had a uh the question was something about you know you guys had a good year how do you build on that right last year was last year uh, it was a good run for us. Not didn't end the way we wanted it to end, but that was a good run for the 2023 Texans. Now, for me, it's a clean slate. We start over 2024. Now, who are we going to be? Right, and you know we have a lot of great matchups versus a lot of uh, great teams this year. And I'm excited to first off build our team again the proper way of guys who are just looking to compete, guys who have their relentless mindset, guys who want to go out play for each other. Guys who want to hunt, guys who want to play with relentless effort and finish. Like, that's what I'm looking to build as we start this offseason. Uh, guys that are looking to hunt, guys that have relentless effort. So many coaches talk about that. The cool thing we saw last year was, okay, on defense especially, that really showed up. Like, this team this team was horrendous at tackling. Like, they were one of the worst teams in terms of missed tackles. But because they got so many guys to the ball – they ended up just it didn't matter as much because they rallied to the ball so much if they can actually clean up their tackling form then so the, that would be awesome that's how you end up becoming a genuinely elite defense I thought brady make a, made a good point here about quarterbacks wasn't it marty schottenheimer said if a rookie qb looks the same year two he's improved do you agree yeah I, I think it's the classic instance of all these teams have a, a year's worth of film on cj stroud now and any little thing that made CJ uncomfortable, it's going to be thrown at him with full force this year. I, I think that he will look better uh, just because I've seen his kind of his trajectory and the stuff that he's able to absorb mentally is just different than other dudes. But uh, it's a it's a good thing to keep in mind.
that sometimes sometimes people characterize something as a sophomore slump when really it's that okay we shouldn't have expected this guy to be you know Joe Montana in his second season unless it's CJ next question was about just the AFC South and the competitiveness of it in general yeah, our division is is definitely really good you think about the young quarterbacks in our division uh with the Colts, the Jags, right, the Titans, and us, we all have really young quarterbacks who all have bright futures. And so really, four really good teams in our division is going to be a battle each and every week that we play each other. But I'm excited about it, right? You want to play against really the top, top, top competition to see where you stack up, right? And I'm excited to see our team, right, develop and grow throughout the year and see where we end up. If I have to power rank the young quarterbacks in the division right now, uh, I would start at four with Will Levis and or whoever finishes the season for them. Anthony Richardson, who I know even though Will Levis has more actual experience, I guess, as a quarterback, he had a huge, huge hot start, but I just didn't see the promise out of him that I saw out of Anthony Richardson. Then Trevor Lawrence almost by default, but I could see those two, Trevor Lawrence and Anthony Richardson, flip-flopping either very quickly or at multiple times during the season next year. I just don't trust that Anthony Richards isn't going to stay healthy. And then, of course, C.J. Stroud. Devin Singletary, a question about Devin Singletary, who is a free agent. Yeah, very pleased with Devin. I remember sitting in a free agent visit with Devin and just, man, his personality, his demeanor, it was a guy I knew I wanted to work with right away. Right, Devin is made of the right stuff. He's a hard worker. He's a leader. He shows up every day in practice with a great attitude, and the guys around him feed off of that. Right, So Devin was a great guy. We'll see what happens in free agency, but we'd we love to have Devin back just because of what he brought to our team. He was uh, he was definitely a bright spot for us in that running back room. Okay, we got to read body language and verbiage when it comes to retaining people that are already on the team. Because remember, Sean Pendergast and I talked about this this morning. Bill O'Brien – was like pretty transparent whether he intended to be or not on uh, how he felt about a guy like it, like it it seemed like he just loved um Tyron Matthew and uh, the fact that Tyron Matthew ended up leaving I think maybe it was part of a rift um, between him and others in the building uh but like with Kareem Jackson when he answered the same question at the combine it felt kind of like yeah we'll we'll see what happens so there by the way he answered that Devin Singletary question I think he likes Devin Singletary. I think he hopes that Devin Singletary is going to be back. Singletary is a good reminder of like sometimes the difficulty coaches themselves have in overcoming whatever assumptions they have going into the season. Because it took it took the team a while to figure out that all right, Devin's got to be the guy, not Damian Pierce. And I understand there's there's something to be said for just patience and playing it out, but Singletary should have been the guy immediately. And then he got better in the second half of the season as everybody started to figure out the offense a little bit more. So I don't think Devin, I think there's a very good chance Devin's not the main guy if he comes back. And these will be many of our free agency discussions, depending on who gets, there's still, I, I personally want, I'd like Derrick Henry on a short-term contract. I know a lot of you really want Saquon Barkley. I've got my reasons to be skeptical of Saquon Barkley that I'll do in my next episode probably, or you can listen on Sports Radio 610. Um, but uh, like Devin's a good example of that, that it's not so easy and quick to latch onto this running game. Next question was about C.J. Stroud's development. You know, when we talk about his growth, I think it starts with the coaches that you surround him with. So we surrounded him with some young coaches, young, talented coaches, and uh, Bobby Slowick, Gerard Johnson, also veteran coaches, and Bill Lazor and Shane Day, uh, who's no longer with us. But we just surrounded him with the right guys in the coaching position, but also in his room, right, having Case Keenum there, a veteran quarterback who's done it at a high level for a long time. So making sure that we have that balance around CJ. So if there's any questions, any things that he may ask or things that he can lean on guys who've been there, done that, seen that before, right? There was not a guy around him that he couldn't ask, he couldn't rely on, who can give him the answers and can share with them his their experiences of how they've seen other quarterbacks right succeed in this league. I think that's one thing that Bobby Sloak deserves credit for too is that they had a lot of voices in that quarterback room. And and sometimes that can be an awesome thing. Sometimes it can be a disaster if you got 
too many chiefs and not not enough uh not enough uh indians you know and i think that bobby slowick is a first-time offensive coordinator did, did a really good job managing that uh bill laser gerard johnson and case keenum i feel good about one of those three guys in no particular order Bill, Lazor, i'm i'm biased because i was teammates college teammates with bill laser but so i said him first but uh, if Bobby Slogan were to leave next year, I think Jarrod Johnson's probably the favorite to get the job. At some point, if Case Keenum decides to retire, uh, then I think he could slide into quarterbacks, possibly offensive coordinator if they start grooming him for that. So there, there's options. I feel better. I feel really good about Bobby Slogan not having gotten a job this year because I think they'll be much better set up and ready to elevate a guy into offensive coordinator next year if um, if it doesn't work out. By that, I, by, if it doesn't work out for us, it'd be good for Bobby Sloak, I guess. Next question was, uh, oh, a Bobby Sloak question. Speak of the devil. I thought Bobby did a really great job being a first-year coordinator. Everybody is kind of hesitant when you have a first-year coordinator, and nobody knows truly what to expect. But uh, for me, knowing Bobby and knowing how detailed he is in his preparation, right, how prepared he is, how he gets his coaches prepared, the way he teaches, like it, it showed up on the film, and I'm – I'm happy for Bobby that he was able to garner the success that he truly deserves, right? And Bobby's success doesn't happen without the players. So I never lose sight of this game is about the players, and it will always be about the players. As coaches, we're just here to assist the players, right, and support them in any way we can. But uh, Bobby doesn't have that success without getting the right players, and the player is performing at a high level. Yeah, I think there's a few things that, D'Amico's done well in terms of either hiring coaches who have the same mindset as him already or that kind of adopt uh, D'Amico's mindset because he's the guy is just that focus on players and, and, you know, understanding that scheme is awesome, but only if your guys can execute it. And, and that's, that sounds like a simple thing with a lot of modern offensive coordinators. I think you, you tend to find, especially amongst the bright young kids, like, Bobby Slowick, that sometimes they they put the X's and O's ahead of the Jimmys and Joes, and they they kind of lose sight of like teaching, actually teaching the offense and figuring out exactly what does and doesn't work, what the guys respond to, all that. And and compared to Bobby Slowick's demeanor, like when you first see him, where you think like, okay, this guy seems like he might be a little bit of a nerdy IT guy. Like he's the exact opposite. Like he really really gives a damn about understanding what the individuals respond to. It's really cool. So uh, next question was about early indicators of CJ Stroud's calm and confident demeanor that D'Amico mentioned earlier. Well, it started right here at the combine, right? When you were evaluating young players, right? you see CJ come into our room in the formal interviews and just see, you know, he had that calmness about him, right, in the room. And you can tell, for me, I can tell instantly like if a guy, you know, has what it takes. Uh, and I, I saw that in CJ when he first sat down and he began to speak to us about his background, right, and his college experience. And then you see, right, his teammates and how they spoke about CJ. I remember being here last year and every Ohio State uh, teammate that sat in our room, they spoke highly of CJ and the type of leader he was and what he meant to them and the things that he did to those guys to – help them. So it's, uh, you can't hide, <laughs> right? Your true character always will, will show. And it showed that CJ was a, a really great guy raised the right way. And he was the same guy throughout the entire year. He didn't change. Right. And that's a uh, true testament to his upbringing, his family, his parents, and the way they raised him. Um, you know, D'Amico said something right there that probably rings true across a lot of things in life in terms of when you're giving somebody a reference or if you are a reference for somebody because a lot of like every single offensive lineman at the combine is going to tell coaches yeah my quarterback was a good guy yeah no he was good I liked him no yeah he was good leader good leader um and like adjectives though like adjectives don't matter as much as stories stories go a lot longer and further in life in a lot of ways but especially here so I, I think with CJ we know enough about him now where the stories that the guys at Ohio State would have told about CJ and his leadership are are going to be about more than just you know speeches or things that he did on the football field it's all that time that he spent actually getting to know those guys 
bringing him to his house for dinner. Um, his ability to keep a calm demeanor in like various circumstances. Like I'm sure D'Amico heard a lot of stories and that's it's maybe some, maybe that's a little bit of how you kind of read between the lines this time of year when nobody's, nobody's very few people are going to outright bash a former teammate or a former coach. Um, but there will be an absence of, of things in their descriptions and CJ's put a lot of time into just really caring about the guys he plays with. Next question was, Oh, about the receiver position and what he's looking for. Yeah, with the receiver position, we're looking for guys who are separators, right? Who can separate, who can find a way to get open, right? And if you have that one redeeming quality that you can separate, right, that's what we're looking for, especially that shows up on third down, right? How do you win third down? How do you stay on the field as an offense, right, and continue to produce uh, and move the ball down the field, it's about third down, right? And being able to convert, and the way you convert is guys who are savvy enough to find a way to always get open. There's just somebody who's shaking that camera there. Um, okay, separators. Tell me in the comments if you guys have a pet wide receiver in the draft that you want. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're looking for Marvin Harrison Jr. That's what, uh, can you guys, can you please just go out and draft a Marvin Harrison Jr.? Um, <laughs> I was wondering about that. Marvin Harrison Jr., one of the knocks on him is that he's not awesome run after the catch. And I, and I wonder how much of that is just because he's like already in the end zone when he does it. I know, I know, I know, I know they, they adjust for all that stuff and everything. Uh, but there is a little bit of something to that. It's it's like the one negative in terms of it's a negative in that he's not like the best in the world at it uh, compared to everything else or he's just the best in the world. Highly doubt they'll get Marvin Harrison Jr. I'll be, be very impressed with uh, Nick if he somehow pulls that off. Shane Steichen, he was asked about Shane Steichen's first year as a coach and what he thinks of him. Yeah, Shane did a really nice job. Uh, I remember going against him our second game, he did a really nice job. Uh, head coach of the Colts, for those of you who have forgotten. He's kind of a milk toast looking dude. He's very forgettable. Nice job. Even you, know, you see a coach who's able to adapt, even though he lost his starting quarterback and Anthony Richardson, right? I mean, backup comes in and Minshew does a really great job and he was able to sustain that throughout the entire year. So I really, I think that speaks highly to the coaching and the coaching staff and the guys you have around. So, I mean, credit to Shane, did a really good job without having his uh, starting quarterback. And we were able to, you know, come here in Indy and have a, you know, a, a matchup there to make the playoffs. So it's a uh, really credit to him. I think always thought highly of Shane. He's back in, uh, back in, uh, in Philly, right? Going against him as a play caller. He's always done a really great job of, of keeping you off balance, right? And really, attacking like what you give him he tries to take advantage of what you give him and not always going for the big play but he's very smart in how he approaches the game planning um <laughs> Steichen's good man like look, look look at the mess that it was in Philadelphia this year and I know they started off okay but I think as teams started to adjust to things and there was no Shane Steichen there to adjust uh, you saw the difference and I, I think the biggest thing in terms of getting a healthy respect for the Colts, the appropriate amount of fear, as Popovich would have called it. It's that they still ran a lot of RPO, but they were doing it with Gardner Minshew instead of Anthony Richardson. And Gardner Minshew's athletic enough, but he's not Anthony Richardson. If Anthony Richardson can stay healthy, that's that's going to be a headache. Um, we also, you know, Jonathan Taylor had his best two games versus the Texans. So that's the that's the battle royale next year. It's the offseason adjustments that Tomiko makes. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with the linebacker position. Uh, when you're, those linebackers kind of get caught in a bind with that RPO where they've got coverage responsibilities, they've got run responsibilities. And if you've got a quarterback and running back that can make you pay, um, it, it's tough to make those decisions. So those guys got to be sharper on that next year. Christian Harris will be. And then it's just a matter of who else is playing back there. Uh, as far as, let's see. Uh, yeah, not impressed with Stike and patchy beard and skinny, not built for the frozen tundra. Has a little bit of a Nick Foles quality to him, right? And uh, somebody else pointed out that um, In the Loop violated the truce, the midday show. I, I expected that. I know, Sean, I, I told Sean, listen, you can call for a truce, but this is like... Um, this is this is like the like Chamberlain waving those papers that Hitler signed, promising not to go to war with him. It's um, you, you can't expect it. You can't expect those guys to abide by any truce. I think Sean's the only one who agreed with it. Next question.
was about uh, Bobby Slow, another Bobby Sloak and Gerard Johnson joint. Well, bringing back Bobby and, and Gerard, I think it helps with the continuity of our offense, right? With a young quarterback, young players around them, you want to continue to build on what those guys did this year. So I'm, I'm happy to not go into a, a new season here and we have to worry about right installing that new offense, right? Or learning, learning new terminology. So now we can hit the ground running. We can really build off of what we did, look at through our self-scout, the things that we did well, things that CJ did well, and how can we continue to put him in those positions to succeed? Yeah, I mean that's a, basically a redux of the first one. Other than that, other than that, CJ's pronunciation of Gerard freaks me out every time because I feel like I, I, there's a coach that I don't know on the roster. He just pronounces a little bit differently. <laughs> wow. Oh, this question was about. He chuckled before. Okay, he chuckled a little bit beforehand about it. I bet. So this is a question about an individual player. I bet. How do you follow up on? Oh no, okay. How do you follow up on CJ and Will in the draft? You made a lot of, like a big splash last year with that that trade up for uh, for Will and the pick of CJ. How do you follow that up? That was uh, that was an exciting draft last year to be able to get right two of the top players in this in the draft class last year to get CJ and Will and two anchors for our team for our locker room. That was that was very important for us to get both guys. How do we follow that up this year? We continue to add guys who fit the Texans culture and that's guys who are made of the right mindset guys who have that relentless mindset guys who are true competitors guys who love football guys who who love pushing their teammates to be their best guys who want to be the best at what they do right we add those type of players to our locker room that's how we follow up a, a great draft last year I think the the biggest thing about those two that's kind of freakish is I, like it's it's hard to nail the intangibles. Like like so many guys, especially like guys have gotten pretty polished at putting their best foot forward, and a lot of them have been known as the guy, and known that their prospects were you know were the NFL since high school. So like most of them are pretty good at saying the right thing, doing the right thing. Quarterbacks especially, they'll they'll use all the buzzwords, but like to get two guys that are just they're they're just unique and i'm not like i'm not being a homer here this is just from from watching them and like i've been in the nfl as a player or covering it in the media since 1997 i don't it's very rare to meet players that have the same personality as will anderson and this and cj stroud that are as genuinely committed to doing things the right way and to also just affecting other people like as, as rookies, especially like to very much take it upon yourself that no, it's not just me I'm working on. I got to try to exude this, this positivity and competitiveness that, that helps all my teammates. It's just, it's really cool amongst guys that are that talented. As far as making a splash, Brock Bowers would be my secret fantasy that if Brock Bowers falls out of the top 10, she might because those top 10 teams are really there's a lot of teams there that are probably going to draft need based and you know tight ends not what you're what you need 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 on your team that Brock Bowers might fall to the middle of the first round and then uh, I don't know I don't know there's a there's a chance that's my little dream scenario next question was um about free agency and like What's the difference between I couldn't these questions were like the Texans press conferences. You can't really hear them. I, I think it was about like the value of guys who have already been on your team and you know versus guys that are, you know, big names or you've only seen on film. Right. When you talk about free agents, when you have that first hand look of the guys who you've spent day after day with, you know them. You know their strengths, you know their weaknesses, right? You know everything about the player. You know how they are when things get hot and heavy like how do they handle it so i think there is an advantage to man i know exactly who this guy is i know exactly how he will respond as opposed to reaching for someone you may on another team that you may not have much info about uh so it, it, there's a lot that goes into it. it's like while we're here at the combine we're trying to gather as much information on these players and their backgrounds as much as we can to identify who they are as a person right and in the free agency process, it kind of gets sped up, and sometimes you miss out on truly figuring out, man, who is this person that we're bringing into our building? So for me, it's always person over player, right? And bringing the right person in is uh, is of high importance to me.
that's a it's a tough one. Oh crap. Did I screw us up? I don't think I did. Um it's a tough one because I've seen it work both ways. It's a yeah, like it's good when a guy knows his player and knows what he can expect him. I benefited from that by Dom Capers being the first coach with the Texans. He knew Gary Walker and I, and you know, I knew he he liked me. I liked him. It was uh as D'Amico said, when it got hot and heavy, Dom knew what he was gonna get out of me. And uh, but the problem, like the other side of it would be like Amon Green um or some of the guys that came in because remember mike sherman had coached him and sometimes you overvalue guys that you know and that's not a shot at on green other than that it was i i think he was a bit overvalued in, in their eyes when they brought him in and you see sometimes coaches will bring guys in that they know and it turns out okay in this environment in this circumstance at this stage in this player's career it actually was a bad move so I, like D'Amico's aware of that i think more importantly i think nick casario is very thoughtful and intentional about looking for his own blind spots, being sure that guys' biases aren't affecting things. And that's that's one of the biases you got to look out for. Next question was, oh, Dalton Schultz, body language. Let's read the body language. He's asked about Dalton Schultz. Dalton really did a really nice job for us in the passing game. Uh, when those two-minute drives where we were able to win a few games, Dalton really showed up in a situation of football, third down. He showed up making big catches for us, so uh, we'll see what happens with Dalton in free agency, but I'm very, very proud of what he did for us last year. Yeah, I don't... Hmm. Is he, is he playing it cool because they don't want to seem like they're too desperate, or does that seem like kind of tepid? I, I He did say, he, he stressed the passing game. He said, Dalton Schultz really helped us in the passing game, that's the way I heard it. He didn't say it that way, but I heard like, yeah, he really helped us a lot in the passing game because uh, like uh, running, not the forte. I, I, with this extra $10 million that was just put on the doorstep of every NFL team, I did feel like maybe that's going to be the thing that gets, gets Dalton Schultz franchi franchise tagged if they don't have a deal, you know, if they can't come to a, a deal with them. And that doesn't preclude you from, draft and another tight end it's just it's a bad year in free agency for tight ends um there's really not anybody out there that it feels earth shatteringly better than than dalton schultz i think you look at a lot of free agency rankings um for whatever they're worth you know obviously those are flawed but dalton schultz is the top guy in a lot of them um so i i i went back on not wanting to franchise tag dalton schultz i think it's affordable enough and just because you're you're unlikely to find somebody you feel flat out awesome about or that will definitely be better than Dalton Schultz right now with his relationship with with CJ Stroud and that kind of that nonverbal communication they already have their ability to adjust routes and everything um I'd, I'd be very very okay with that next question oh a, a Chris a Christian Harris question we'll talk about linebackers after this Christian Harris question because I got thoughts and concerns no sky's the limit for Christian Christian is one of the the fastest linebackers that I've had a chance to work with, very explosive, instinctive player. So I'm excited. I see last year as Christian's rookie year. That was his first year, and I'm excited to see him build off of what he did last year. Oh, so he's saying it was like it last, like last year was his rookie year. Uh, it, at least in that defense, it was, and he, he got better and better as the year went on. I think in a lot of ways, uh, like it just clicked for him about a third of the way through the season. The thing about Christian Harris and the thing about Christian Harris that I worry about is that I think you need to pair him with a guy that's still either a veteran um, or just a little bit more advanced. Maybe there's somebody with familiarity with, with similar types of things that D'Amico does. Uh, just because I think Christian Harris doesn't need to be the guy right now that wears the green dot on his helmet, the play caller. I don't worry about Mike or Will as much because everybody's, there's so much motion and everything nowadays anyway that Mike and Will might as well be the same um, sometimes. But I, 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 and I think he can play physically, either Mike or Will. But the guy that has the green dot and has to make all the play calls and all the adjustments and everything, I feel like that's just at least a year ahead of where Christian Harris is right now. And, you know, D'Amico had Fred Warner in San Francisco, and Fred Warner is like Einstein smart when it comes to getting the defense going. And uh, it and it doesn't slow him down one bit. I feel like Christian Harris is still like D'Amico said. If, if like last year was his rookie year, this wouldn't be the the year you want to put the green dot on his helmet. So that 
leads to Patrick Queen, who I think also is a guy that just likes playing downhill, doesn't necessarily need to be the play caller in the defense. So I don't know if they're a good fit or a match. The one, like, I don't know if this is meager or weak or what, but I, I like the idea of a Levante David. Um, I don't think he's going to leave. I don't think he's going to leave Tampa. I doubt they'll let him leave, and he'll probably take a hometown discount because he's been there for 13 years. Um, but somebody like that would be would be good. Uh, Aziz Al Shair and Frankie Louvu are the other two guys that I'm interested in. I'm I'm not sold on Louvu's pass coverage ability, um, and Blake Cashman has a hard time staying healthy. But I do I like Blake Cashman a lot. But I'd like him to come back as part of the the rotation. But I'm not so sure he needs to be the guy. But there are names I like Louvu is not the ideal and perfect candidate because I I really I'm hungry for a guy that's really awesome in coverage. But Louvu makes just a, a boatload of plays. Next question was Oh, okay. Somebody was asking questions where I feel like she's writing an article about nepotism and coaching hires or something. Because uh her first question was how does she scout how does uh, D'Amico scout assistant coaches? It's, it's, it's challenging to keep up with the coaches, but I think with me and how do you evaluate those coaches, you really rely on it's a, you rely on those people that they've been with, right? Coaches that they've been around and guys they have experience with, and you just want to learn how they are as workers, like right? how dedicated are those guys to perfecting their craft, right? Are they guys who have no ego? And they're willing to do whatever it takes to just help the team. And I think that's how you truly define, right, good young assistant coaches. Are they, I tell coaches all the time, are you the best at what you do? Or are you looking to pursue something else, right, inside of doing the best job that you have, right? Whether you're, if you're coaching the tight ends, are you the best tight end coach? Are you a QC? Are you the best at breaking down information or getting the information to the coaches just be faithful over a few things and you'll get blessed with more. Yeah, man, that's one thing. If you can be of service to the people above you, then those people will usually, if they're not D bags, uh, they'll do every, they'll do, they'll help you get along to the next spot as long as you're actually doing your job current, your current job really, really well. Cause that means that's helping them out and they'll, they'll, they'll anticipate good things for you. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to be telling them you're, 10 point plan for improving the business every single week. The other part there too, that I found interesting was uh, the no ego part. And we talked about that earlier with Bobby Slowick. And I think the way that D'Amico approaches the game, trying to just, you know, always remember that it's about the players. It's not about you. You can't have too much pride to maybe change your mind uh, or to change your viewpoint on something. Uh, but the other part too, if indeed she's asking a question about or writing an article about nepotism, because the follow up was something about like having a relationship with with coaches or something. D'Amico hired uh, uh, Matt Burke last year without ever. I don't think he had ever met him in person until he inter until Matt Burke interviewed for the job. So it's not like he just went out and got his cronies or something. And I, and I wondered at the time, I might have to ask D'Amico about this sometime. I think we always forget that Chip Kelly was an influence on D'Amico because D'Amico played for Chip Kelly. But that was one thing that Chip Kelly did when he came into the league. He understood, like, look, all right, I don't know any that much about the NFL. I'm not going to just hire people that I know because I'm really – I don't know that many people. So he went out and he hired a lot of guys, one of whom was Jeff Stoutland, the offensive line coach, who's still the offensive line coach in Philadelphia. So – and he, to my understanding, I don't think Chip Kelly had ever met Jeff Stoutland, um, other than like through the, the, his relationship with Nick Saban, because Stoutland was at Alabama. So, um, yeah, I don't. I think D'Amico's pretty pretty good about that. Obviously, there's been some nepotism and uh, friendly connections with Bobby Slowick and guys like that, but I think he's open to to everybody. I think it comes a lot. Uh, also, with coaching, it comes to right with our our scouting department, who's on the road, they go to colleges and they see coaches, they're at practices, so they see these coaches actually in action, working with the young players, and that's where I gain a lot of insight from our scouts, our college scouts who are on the road to see, man, how was this guy in his drills, right? And that's, that speaks highly to me, and I gain a lot of information from our college scouts. All right. I see uh, somebody made a good point about Levu, yeah. He was, he was all over the place. I should. I'll, I'll try to go back and watch that that game. I, I was meaning to watch a game, a Texans game from this season, uh, this weekend, and then I got stuck on the Raiders Chiefs. 
because the the Raiders beat the Chiefs and just really just took it to him. So I was, I was looking for inspiration. Um, is Al Shair, did he get franchise tagged? Somebody asked if Al Shair was even uh, was was even available. I don't know, man. Uh, last question. It was from the kid reporter. That kid. He's a he's a kid reporter. Oh, and it was about. Oh, is he excited to see more former players like himself become head coaches? Yeah, for me, for me with the with the success we've had, I'm you know I'm excited to see more former players step into coaching right, and become head coaches because uh, there are a lot of talented players, former players who've done it at a high level, guys who understand the game, guys who can connect and relate with players, and guys who can lead. So I would, I would love to see even more former players step up and become head coaches. And I think you saw that, you know, in this hiring cycle uh, with Antonio Pierce, with Jared Mayo, like most guys are getting those opportunities, right? And I'm excited to see those guys be successful as well. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Yeah, I saw that. Um, hey, back again. Dan Campbell asked, answered a question about that. I don't know if it was from the same kid or not. That kid's good if it's the same kid that's been there the last couple of years. Makes me a little bit jealous of how good he is. Uh, I'm going to do a uh, some free agency profiles next. I'm going to do Christian Wilkins this afternoon, and I'm going to try to get to uh, one of the edge rushers, probably Josh Allen. Josh Allen versus John Grenard. Uh, Josh Allen obviously is the more high end, top level, top three in sacks, top five in pressures. Um, just your your prototype edge rusher. He's a bit small for my liking, and I don't think D'Amico would necessarily like him. But he'd be too, uh, in terms of size. I think he would like Josh Allen. I just don't. I think D'Amico probably wants a, a a guy opposite Will Anderson, who's a little bigger. But whatever. Like getting after quarterback is first and foremost. The biggest thing about him, though, is that the Jaguars blitzed a good amount. In a good chunk of Josh Allen's production this year came with like either no or minimal blocking whereas with Grenard um you know the Texans were amongst the lowest blitzing teams in the league and he and Will Anderson had to really earn everything they got like the blitz for the Texans in in D'Amico's world the blitz is your four-man pass rush like he wants those guys to be so good that you don't have to blitz and they get it done up front and like so Josh Allen I think would still be really good in that regard it's just he's gotten a little bit more help from the scheme than John Grenard did, but he's also just super, super productive. John Grenard, people are guessing maybe like a, a three-year, $50 million contract compared to Josh Allen that would get, let's see. So my free agency, my free agency workshop. It's, it, there you go. If you can understand all that, those are my hopes and dreams. Um, four years, 110 million for Josh Allen. I saw as one of the projections. John Grenard about three years, 50 million. And Grenard plays his butt off versus the run. The biggest thing is he just he gets injured, or he has gotten injured a lot. And he got injured this year. So I love, I love John Grenard, but that makes me a little bit nervous. I'm Seth Payne. For those of you who don't know me, I played for the Texans. And uh, you can follow this YouTube channel. I'm gonna start doing my free agency profiles for guys who don't get franchise tagged in the next couple of days. And we'll start doing some draft profiles after that. And you guys told me to go look at those. Uh, the receivers who get the best separation. I'll do that too. Thanks, everybody. Subscribe, tell a friend, see something, say something, all that.